Let me thank Alice Pauley for um, giving us quite a challenge. Thank you very much, and thank you for coming. Um, so we thought we would now have a panel of um, four people, one of whom is Alice, who at this point does not need any introduction. Um, and so I will introduce our other three panelists. Um, and then each of the other three will uh, take five minutes at the podium. Um, uh, and, and then we'll have a discussion among the panel and taking questions from the audience. So um, the first of our three panelists is Janelle Knox Hayes. Um, she's the Lister Brothers Associate Professor of Economic Geography and Planning and the head of the Environmental Policy and Planning Group in the, our Department of Urban Studies and Planning. She holds a visiting research fellow at the Smith School of Enterprise and the Environment at Oxford University. And her research focuses on the ways in which social and environmental systems are governed under changing temporal and spatial scales as a consequence of globalization. Her latest project examines how social values shape sustainable development. So, and Janelle will speak first after I complete introducing David and Susan. Um, David McGee, our second panelist, is an associate professor in the Department of Earth, Atmospheric, and Planetary Sciences. And he's the director of Terrascope, a learning community where MIT's first year students work in teams to solve complex real world problems starting in their first semester at MIT. His research focuses on understanding the atmosphere's response to past climate, to, excuse me, to past climate changes by documenting past changes in precipitation and winds using geochemical measurements of stalagmites, lake deposits, and marine sediments, and interpreting these records in the light of models and theory aiming to offer data-based insights into the patterns, pace, and magnitude of past climate changes. And uh, our third panelist is Susan Silby, the Leon and Ann Goldberg Professor of Humanities, Sociology, and Anthropology in Shass, and the Professor of Behavioral and Political Sciences in the Sloan School of Management, where she teaches in the programs in Work and Organizational Studies and Economic Sociology. Um, from 2017 to 19, she served as MIT's chair of the faculty. And Susan is interested in the governance, regulatory, and audit processes in complex organizations. Her current research focuses on the creation of management systems for containing risks, including ethical lapses, as well as environment, health, and safety standards. And since 2003, she has been working and publishing with graduate students and colleagues on gender patterns in the education and career of engineers. So thank you all three for joining us, and thank you, Professor Pauly, and um, I'll ask Janelle to start. Thank you very much for the introduction, and I'll try to keep my remarks um, short and in the spirit of the memorial for Professor Flowers today. I think what I have to say aligns very nicely with, with what Professor Pauly sure. presented. Um, and so I, I wanted to start with this idea that we're in the midst of a digital revolution, I think, which we're all familiar with. This year, the world contains 44 zeta bytes, or 44 trillion gigabytes of information, which is a tenfold increase from just three years ago. And so this digital revolution, I think, is transforming the way in which we educate, we research, and even how we think and analyze the world. Um, this graphic at the bottom shows that there's also a 40% increase in the amount of data that's produced by machines. And so I think that trend of both the generation of information as well as the cutting edge, which is the analysis of information with cognitive analysis, machine learning, artificial intelligence, is going to have a profound implication on STEM education going forward. Already MIT has embraced this trend with the creation of the College of Computing um, in which it declares this will be a bold initiative to accelerate pioneering research and innovation in computing, and above all, educate lead leaders for the algorithmic future. Um, so I wanted to address this idea and think about what does it mean for climate change and what is happening in the rest of the world. And I think while the digital revolution is transforming education, it also has the potential to transform, to bifurcate, potentially, to isolate and alienate our experience of the world or the experience of some groups of people in the world. This is just one example. This is a story from 2017 in the New York Times that's looking at the effect of financialization, the digitization of the economy uh, on in in income inequality rates and how that's accelerated, uh, particularly since the start of this century. 
For climate change, I think it also has severe implications. So we've seen the, the effects of, of radical climate change and what that means for a material world. Uh, this summer in Australia, or this summer season in Australia, with the extreme fires spread across the country. Across the world in the communities I'm working with in Louisiana, we're seeing uh, you know, the other adverse effects of climate change, extreme flooding and land loss. And so one of the communities I've been working with, Ile de Jean Charles, they're declared uh, among America's first climate change refugees, last week filed a complaint at the United Nations with several other tribes alleging that the US government has violated their human rights by failing to take action on climate change. And among other things, they address the continued land loss and how this threatens the tribe's source of food. Uh, they talk about the lack of autonomy they have because they don't have federal recognition and the way the state governments have not done enough, particularly to acknowledge their culture, their identity, how they make sense of their communities and their place, and to think about these communities as they're facing forced migration, forced relocation. We had the communities here in September for a workshop, workshop in, in my department, and this is a nice, we probably won't be able to make a lot of sense of this, but this was a graphic um, facilitation of the workshop. You could read kind of going from the left to the right where the tribes first presented their experience of what's happening in their communities. And I wanted to hone in on one thing in particular. They identified this clash, the clash with decision makers, the clash with researchers, um, the clash and governance of their values and their vision for what they need moving forward as they confront climate change and what they're facing in an increasingly technocratic response to how to do planning and how to think about the relocation of these communities. And so I know my time is very brief, but I just wanted to put that idea out there in the spirit of Professor Flowers. I think, I, I personally, unfortunately, didn't know him, but from what I know of him, his, his real strength was that he created a community of inclusion. He created a community of access. And so as we create, as we confront the digital realities that we face, I think we have to think about that that spirit and that approach moving forward is how do we, initiatives like the College of Computing, how do we make those inclusive? How do we think about the ways in which that college might include other ways of knowing? Um, and so in that vein, I guess I would conclude by saying we don't need steam, we need steam, right? It's the, <laughs> it's the Yiddish steam. It, ha it includes the humanities and the social sciences with the arts. Thank you. <laughs> Um, I want to thank first the, first the organizers for the chance to be here today. Um, so we have this big question in front of us of, in light of the climate crisis and systemic inequities, how do we reconceive STEM education or STEAM education? Um, and, and I'm going to offer some thoughts based upon my experience with Terrascope, which over the last 20 years, um, you know, I can't say has the answer but in Professor Polly's language has, has at least been walking and asking lots of questions. Um, so before I begin, I want to acknowledge the, the leadership of Professor Penny Chisholm and former MIT professors Kip Hodges, Raphael Bross, and the late Sam Bowring, um, the directors who preceded me, as well as the tireless and wise contributions of lecturer Ari Epstein, who's here. Um, all of them have played central roles in shaping what the program is today. So Terrascope is a first-year learning community at MIT, and it focuses on project-based, student-centered engagement with environmental challenges. Each year, we choose a different challenge. So the challenges of over the last three years have included um, preparing for the impacts of climate change on the MIT campus and in southern Bangladesh, um, securing access to clean water on the Navajo Nation, preparing for future storms in Puerto Rico. In the fall term, a group of approximately 50 students works to develop a proposal to address each year's challenge, which they then communicate in a website in a public presentation in front of a group of invited experts, most of whom come either directly from or with direct experience with the communities that are at the center of that year's challenge. Throughout the term, students have a great deal of freedom as to how they conduct research, how they break the problem down, how they organize themselves, and how they develop and present their proposal. So in this description lie the two essential elements of Terrascope's approach. 
First, we focus classes around real world problems in which eth ethics, equity, climate change are integral components that cannot be separated, that students cannot help but come up against. You probably noticed that our topics are not simply scientific or engineering challenges. History, culture, economics, colonization, po political power, the lack of it, civil society and public policy are inextric inextricably entwined. And any serious proposal must address these facets rather than focusing solely on what for MIT students is the safe territory of technological fixes. Second, we give students a great deal of control over both the process and the products of their learning. So as you can imagine, when you com combine these two things, the complexity of these problems, a lot of student agencies, uh, agency, there are bumps along the way. And each year is different, but very commonly, students struggle with challenges such as how to communicate among groups, how to make decisions when there are trade-offs inherent in every option, how to build a coherent proposal rather than a disorganized list of ideas, and how to handle the vertigo that comes when confronting challenges in their full complexity, rather than curated by instructors into historical or ethical or technical stovepipes. Rather than seeing these as problems to be avoided in the classroom, we think that these challenges are really essential to students learning to work in diverse groups and to address, to address real world problems. To help students along, there are regular chances for reflection and discussion. At the beginning of the term, we also do our best to center voices of those closest to the issues. For example, by bringing to campus um, Navajo or Diné leaders and cultural experts for visits and informal time with students. There's a group of about 25 alumni mentors who offer feedback throughout the term, eight to 10 undergraduate teaching fellows, and of course, Ari and I providing feedback. And then at the end of the term, expert panelists that are providing public responses and questions. And so we believe that this process of broadening the numbers of voices and the range of voices that students are hearing is helpful for students to deepen their understanding of the problem and their role in addressing it. Following on the, spring, on the fall term, we take a trip over spring break to gain first-hand experience, to meet people working day to day to address the year's problem. There's also a spring term radio class where students interview people about their experiences and knit these interviews together into a piece that communicates these experiences to broad audiences. And then in the spring term design class, students work to, in small groups to prototype projects that address aspects of the year's problem. So what are students' experiences? What, what do students take away from this? Here's just a couple of voices. Um, one from, from a student from last year, Jessica Horowitz. I came in to Terrascope thinking I would devise some innovative, creative new invention. Instead, I think I learned a very valuable lesson about problem solving in the real world for real people. What was important was not inventing something outrageous that no one had ever thought of before, but rather understanding the culture of the Diné, Diné empathizing with their lifestyle, needs, and values, and using the resources available to find a solution that was the best for them. It didn't have to be fancy or impressive. It had to be practical, culturally conscious, and easily adaptable. And then uh, more succinctly from Joey Noscheck from um, a few years ago, the most important thing I learned in Terrascope, the power of looking for the answers yourself. In most classes, the professor tells you stuff, then you get an exam. There isn't a lot of teaching in Terrascope, but there's a humongous amount of learning. These responses start to get at the learning experience that at least some students have in Terrascope. It's also, I should say, been a profound experience for me as an educator. And I want to just close by naming two things that I have taken away. One is not shrinking back from um, this centering of real world problems in all their complexity in our classes, even though they don't fit neatly into disciplinary boundaries, they don't permit problem sets, they don't permit closed form correct, correct solutions. Um, and secondly, in Terrascope, as in the other first year learning communities, ESG and Concourse, um, there's a rich range of conversations among colleagues about how and why and for whom we educate. And uh, being a part of these conversations has been incredibly enriching for me personally, and I wish to, I wish to broaden these conversations more generally around MIT. That's why I'm part, excited to be a part of today's event, um, and I look forward to opportunities to, to broaden the conversation about education around MIT. All right, thank you.
How do I do it? Wait, no, when I just go like that. Don't yeah. do it now. Don't do it. Okay. Oh, am I? Yeah, you're live. Okay, thank you very much. So I want to thank Professor Pauli for her comments. I thought they were marvelous, and I particularly appreciated uh, that you had some of my favorite footnotes and citations there, people whose work I teach as well. Uh, I agree with very much of what you said. <clears throat> I also want to echo what my colleague Sally Haslanger said earlier about the fact that we at MIT have, have three schools out of the five for whom a normative and political analysis is at the heart of what we do. The problem is, as has already been said, and others have said, the problem is boundary crossing. Uh, they, they, I, I won't use, they may be silos, et cetera, but I would also want to take issue with, your, with the illusion that somebody made that the uh, faculty in science, technology, and society uh, are not speaking sufficiently to the engineers and uh, scientists. That may be true of the meetings you go to, which I go to also, but I can assure you that my colleagues in anthropology and in STS spend most of their time looking at talking with science and engineers. That's what we do most of the time. But talking across disciplines and fields is not easy. <coughs> and <coughs> actually making connections across them is very difficult. And they are particularly difficult when you don't have the same resources with which to act and reach out, right. and they are seriously skewed at this institution. And you might not have the resources, and you also, as has already been said, don't have the legitimacy of your knowledge is equivalent to others' knowledge. And the combination of resources and legitimacy are essential to act with power or influence. It is also difficult to have influence in the face of the word you used, one of my favorite words, hegemony. Not a word one hears often at MIT. So I'm going to define it a little bit, OK? So hegemony is used by political scientists to mean the most powerful. But that's not what sociologists mean and not what Professor Pauli mean. Hegemony refers to that which everybody knows without saying. It's what everybody does without thinking. The hegemonic is the way things are. I'll just give you an example in this room is that the seats are arranged to look at us. They're not arranged as in many classrooms in a circle. Or take a more simple one that I use in my classes. We're all dressed, bodies covered. Well, that's not hegemonic everywhere in the world. In many places in the world, people walk around showing more of their bodies. Just banal, absolutely banal. But then there are things that build up that are not quite so banal. But I wrote a paper, or published a paper 25 years ago called Subversive Stories and Hegemonic Tales. So what's the opposite of the hegemony is the subversive. And what's a subversive story versus a hegemonic tale? A subversive story is one which, as Professor Pauli pointed out, that connects the particular to the general what she said was the micro and the macro. A subversive story connects the individual to the larger situation in escalating scales. So what is the hegemonic? The hegemonic is burying and hiding the connections between particular events, persons, preferences to the pattern which constitutes eventually the taken for granted world that we don't pay attention to. So now I want to take these notions and apply them to engineering education. Now my slide. And the fact, or hegemonic fact, about engineering education is that it is, in the United States, the only profession in which you can be a licensed member with an undergraduate degree. 
please hear me, it is the only profession in the United States of the standard uh, high status professions, not semi-professions. That Now, what is a profession? Maybe I should define a profession. A profession is an occupation in which experts are allowed to exercise discretion in solving problems. That's very important. They exercise momentary or situational discretion. That is, they're not programmed. This is the only profession. Now, what I put up on the board are public reports from the National Academy of Engineering, from ABET, that start in um, 1918 and go to 2005. There are actually one or more that I didn't put on this list. This is an old list. And as you can see, these are lists of reports about the status of engineering education. And what do these reports routinely say? It's a failure. It's a failure. We neglect to include human factors. Or we neglect to include organizational dynamics. Or more recently, we neglect to include uh, studies of business. We, and now, we neglect to include, again, the human and normative. Why do these reports come over and over and over again? They come over, over, and over again because this is a four-year degree. Because it is a four-year degree, and now I have to read something I've written and I can't see without my glasses, okay? As a four-year degree, it attracts students seeking training for an occupation more than education. It attracts a higher number of people for whom this is the first generation of higher education. It attracts people for whom the costs of education are heavily burdensome, and therefore it must pay off quickly, okay? Because it encourages this need for the education. We can't make it like medicine, which, as you know, could go on for 10, 15 years before you earn a decent living. Or even law, which is, frankly, folks, if you want to know, the easiest profession to get. It's the one I sometimes am in. And um, it's only three more years. And in law school, don't, if you want to really know, only the first year counts. Okay. <laughs> and then after that, you can basically do what you want. That's how you get people like me. Okay. Now, um, because it's four years, and you have to squeeze all that technical knowledge, most of the classes can't be discretionary. We've got to get it in so that you don't build a car that explodes or the rocket fails, as we know, right? Okay, so there's lots and lots of required courses. And there's no room for politics, for philosophy, for the normative, for an explanation of ambiguity and uncertainty, for social construction. We have to get that right. We have to make that machine work so it doesn't damage people, okay? So what is the consequence? So here at MIT, we do require eight courses in the humanities and social sciences, but maybe you should know how students take those courses. They have choices of what to take because it's a, everybody has to do what they like to do. We can't tell them what to do. And so over a third of the courses are taken in economics and in foreign languages. Well, let me tell you, that's not about ambiguity. That's not about uncertainty. That's not about figuring out how people live, make decisions, and contribute their values. It's not about any of those things. And then if we add music, we've got much more than a third. So when are they studying with Professor Haslanger, or with me, or with Janelle? They don't have a lot of room. They can only fit very few of them in because they have to take those requirements. 
Now, what does this do? This produces, in the end, a profession which has, and you're not going to like this, lower status. Lower status than law and medicine. A occupation that does not rise as frequently to the top of organizations as their leaders. Not a happy story for MIT. Okay? And what happens is that this focus on instrumental reasoning and instrumental learning chases out all those issues about which everybody is speaking. Susan. Finished. That's, it. <laughs> That's my message. Thank you. <laughs> So I, I'm going to um, take the, the privilege of chairing the session by asking the first question. Um, basically, of everyone except David in the following sense. Um, um, so I, I'm reflecting on the fact that this is a festival of learning. Uh, and, and David already talked in his remarks about the, the focus in Terrascope, not, not on what he's teaching, but what, on the student, what the students are learning. And so I want to sort of riff on that. Um, and, and I'll also say, to tie it back to, to Woody, this, this, I, I didn't know Woody anywhere near as well as those who spoke about him at the beginning of the day, but uh, this is, I think, uh, very much the way Woody would have, would have thought also, focusing on, focusing on what students are learning more than on what we are trying to teach. Um, I will say my experience with Woody is that he was on my faculty advisory committee. I lead the MITx effort at MIT, and he was on our advisory committee, and he continuously pushed us in two directions which sound opposite, but in fact were the same for him. First of all, he was always pushing us to anchor everything we do in what happens on MIT's campus. Um, and second of all, he was always challenging us when in looking out at the world to be bolder, to do more, to, to go farther, to, to, to not stop with what we're already doing, but to do something more. Um, and I think that that flows into his thinking about um, many things that we heard earlier today. And the question I want to ask everyone except David, David can go last, is, so for you, you talked about a class with 120 students in 30 groups of four. What do you hope they're learning in that class? Um, um, for Susan, pick, pick a class that you, you teach. What are you, what are you hoping that they learn in the context of today's conversation? Um, and Janelle, same thing. So think of a class that you actually teach. And in the context of the topics of the day, what do you, what do you hope that the students in your class are learning and how? Uh, you, you can go first if you like. Uh, I, I have two sort of primary goals in our class. So my, I teach one section. I should say my, my section, it's a section of 120, but it is in concert with 15 other sections that are taught at the same time. So the class is 2,300 students. Uh, so there's a large infrastructure behind it. And what, but what I feel like my goal as an instructor is, is for them to learn that teaming is much harder than doing the design project. Like teaming, teaming well, learning to work with others is, uh, is the hardest part of the class way over the coding in MATLAB. Okay. But the, with respect to this broader question, I want them to leave thinking that their obligation for thinking about energy and climate emission production is at the same level as thinking about safety and cost. Thank you. Susan or Janelle. Oh. So uh, I sometimes teach an undergraduate course called Power interpersonal, organizational, and global dimensions. I haven't taught it in a while. But um, uh, what I hope that students learn is that power is not a thing that people have in their pockets. People don't have power. They enact power. And power is the outcome of an interaction with other people in which you can draw on resources. Those resources are not perfectly distributed in the world. And there are a variety of kinds. Some, are, some can be material resources. Others can be moral resources. Some can be personality, et cetera. Janelle. <clears throat> so this semester, I'm actually teaching a new class um, about climate change cities, cities climate change mitigation and adaptation. And I'm co-teaching with Cynthia Rosenzweig, who's the co-director of the Urban Climate Change Research Network. And so I'm really excited about this. We're going to start it with urban studies and planning. 
is a kind of practical practitioner's guide to think about. If you do become a, a state or a city planner, how do you think about climate adaptation and the strategies you might pursue to bring a city online with responding to climate change? Um, but then we're hoping that this eventually also becomes an online course that could be accessed by city officials around the world so that it has real practical ramification. And I think what I'm hoping most that students take away is this experiential idea of how do you, how do you get to know communities, how do you gather their values, and how do you integrate that with technical knowledge and making a plan. David, do you want to add? While David adds if he wishes, I'm going to look for hands, so I'm looking out. But David, if you want to add. I'll quickly echo what Dr. Pauly said, which is the, the centrality of the group experience and how, you, how students organize themselves and, and, and have voice. And, I, and I'll, just one other quick thing, I think, is that many students come into our class, as one of the student quotes intimated, thinking that they're, gonna, that they're at the center of this, sol this problem solving. Mm -hmm. And they come to realize how much expertise mm -hmm. already exists, how many of the technologies that are needed already exist, and that the problem is more about the structures around the problem, not okay. rather than. So we'll take a few for questions much. for any member of the panel. I saw one on the corner of my eye there. Yeah. Hi, my name is Kimberly. I'm a grad student in Mekki. I really commend you guys' efforts to culture, to foster a culture of, um, what I hear is leadership that we need to foster in our community. And, um, you know, when we talk about teamwork, ambiguity, building better judgment, um, that to me means team, that means leadership to me. And that's something that really rings true when I hear Susan talking about our profession as engineers and how we want to Include, and make leadership something that we care about. Um, I see that, I, I'm thinking also about the recent events that have happened at MIT with regards to the Epstein scandal and it's uh, the response by students, faculty, and the administration. Um, and I just also wanna just ask you guys, you know, how can we as a community with our own faculty, um, acad the academic community in general, how can we foster a culture of leadership, not just focused on students? Um, I, yeah, you know, I actually, I was part of, I was thinking about when you, this, the first question you asked about what do you remember from classes or what do you want students to take away, I was thinking about my own undergraduate experience and I had, I think I was a triple major in the end, so I had a very ambitious course of study and I was trying to recall what do I remember from that and I, I mean, almost nothing from my courses. I don't remember organic, I'm, I'm ashamed to say, I had good grades, I don't remember organic chemistry, I mean, very loose ideas of how you put molecules together. But I remember almost everything from this president's leadership class that I took, and at the, I was at the University of Colorado. It was a small group of students every year that would do this, and it was experiential. We would do things like we would go to a sweat lodge, and participate in a sweat ceremony, or we would build houses for Habitat for Humanity. Um, one year we read Tuesdays with Maury and then we all had to go to a graveyard and sit amongst the gravestones and read the epitaphs. It was incredibly powerful to think about not just what are you learning in school, but then how do you make a meaningful life out of what you're learning? How do you give back to a community? How do you engage so that when you look back on your life, you have kind of the memories that Professor Flower has of your ex Flowers has of his, of, of, of his experience. And so I think we need more of that. I mean, I think it exists already at MIT in pockets, but I think we need to think more holistically about the kind of experience that every undergraduate gets coming through our programs here. Okay, we, people can continue with that, but let's take one more question also. Um, okay, sorry, so I think for me, I'm sorry, I'm an undergraduate in math and computer science, and I think that one of the reasons at MIT students majoring in engineering and math and science don't think about how their, how it relates to the humanities and to social science is because so much of our career paths afterwards are solely focused on technical work at large companies. And so my question is how can we push MIT to divest both from fossil fuel companies but other companies that don't align with MIT's values and more broadly, how can, we have, how can we make sure MIT students have paths other than working for corporations that are part of the problem? Vote. 
go to the polls and vote. Can I see other hands also? And add other voices. Uh, yes, right there in the in the center, and then um, and then we'll take one more up there afterwards. What do you think of the role of science fiction in, in all its various genres in terms of systems thinking, ethics, and you know predicting future? I'll take that. Okay. Susan. So. I would like to say that the anthropology department has periodically offered a course in science fiction to illuminate with the students the moral worlds that are created in different science fiction writing. And uh, so that's something. I would also point out my colleagues offer a course. I'm not trying to advertise. It's just that we do do these things uh, on the meaning of life. And again, in that class, like in others, and I want to respond to this focus on experiential, not to denigrate it, but the point that was already made, that one of the things one learns when one works on something, if with a spirit of understanding that other people have been here before, and they have struggled with this problem, and there is, I fear sometimes, and perhaps it's the digital world and the nature of life on in online or whatever, to think that everybody's an inventor. We're not. We're not all inventing. And it's helpful to know what other people have thought and written. You'll get some models of living a better life when you explore what other people have done. Right there. Hi, my name's Epa Rixey. I'm a first year economic sociology PhD student here at MIT. Uh, and in undergrad, I studied mechanical engineering and human and organizational development, which was a very odd double major. Um, I was the only student at Vanderbilt to do it. Um, and I think the reason more people don't do that is because there's a bit of a stigma within an engineering mindset of taking some of those softer skills, more like, quote, touchy-feely type classes um, and not to, not to pick on uh, the earlier question that was asked, but if you go into a corporation to get anything done, you have to work with people. I mean, even if you're a coder sitting by yourself at a computer, your code has to interface with other people's code. Human issues are one of the most important things to getting anything done. So how do you think we could do a better job of trying to break down some of that stigma Th with taking some of these softer skills courses uh, and some of the more experiential learning type opportunities that you guys are talking about. Well, oh. So uh, one, one thing that we're doing at Purdue is we don't call them soft skills. Exactly. We call them professional skills because of the whole framing of, thank you, <laughs> uh, but other people have made this point, but the framing of soft is part of the whole sort of problematic uh, dualism model of like, well, if it's soft, then it must not be hard in both senses of the word, right? Yeah. So um, I, I remember I had a student once who uh, was bombing his like teaming evaluation scores. On, we use a tool called CAPNI to assess team effectiveness four times throughout our term. And he did not care because he said, I'm being paid to be here uh, from my country is paying me to be here and pay for my tuition and I will go back and I will uh, work with uh, nobody. I, I thought, well, I think, find that hard to believe. Somehow you will have to work with people. But he insisted, no, he will live in a box and not ever talk to people. <laughs> and, and I said, well, okay, well, at the end of the day, the Purdue degree means that you should be able to, right? So we had a symbol around what what it meant to be a, a Purdue engineer, which means you, you are a hard worker and that you are very solid and reliable. And, and uh, our, the folks who come and recruit at Purdue know that. And it means you can work with people. In a, and we train our students in a way that I didn't have as an undergrad that I haven't seen in many other schools that don't have first year engineering. Like we talk about the technical knowledge about working with others. There are ways to do it better. And we frame that as part of what it means to be a Purdue engineer. And I think part of working on problems that are too big to be solved by one person gives students a sense of the need to develop those skills um, rather than just having a professor come in and say, you, you, know, you should learn this. Yeah, or maybe also this idea that you take the applied approach so that the, the students are learning the same set of skills, but they, they have a real human problem, something that's applied that has social justice ramifications, and so they kind of couple 
the humanities and the social side of it with the technical skills they need for their Instead of learning it over here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I have, I have two other comments, though, I want to sort of connect that. I've been ruminating on some of these previous questions. I want to say something about the science fiction, fiction question. Uh, I took a transformative class as a graduate student, which was about feminist science and technology, like uh, feminist science theory and feminist science fiction together. And having the two together as, as, as someone who was an engineering you know, student at all the different levels, that was really meaningful for me. It helped me put the feminist theory I was learning into direct context in the, in, through a thought experiment. And I think that it, it can be useful for uh, sort of playing out in people's minds, you know, what is a potential future this direction? But I also want to think about this question, um, especially because you, you're an undergrad, right? Thank you for coming. Um, about the question of your work is so focused on technical work that there's no room to sort of have uh, these other conversations. I think that that's a framing that even if your work is framed as technical work, as people are saying, there is no way of doing that without engaging with others. And so to frame it as, therefore, we don't need to have these conversations is uh, doing somebody some work. So that is, that's helping somebody's agenda, and I'm not thinking it's ours. Um, oh, right there. I'm, we, I'm Caroline one, Jones. One last question on each side, and then, and then I'll, I have some thank yous to, to, to do. And I love the, I'm in architecture, and I love the way the conversation's going. Um, and these are deep conversations that are happening at every level at MIT, and I'm really grateful to you all for coming together to, to raise the questions. I want to slightly complicate my dear friend Susan Silby's framing. A music class is also about people. Culture, our students have a voracious appetite for culture. So they use their free admission to the MFA more than any other undergraduates in this town. So they're voting with their feet because culture and uh, studying culture, participating in culture, making art is an incredibly rapid way to explore what it means to be human and how, how you can be human together with other humans who might have to bow at the same time, who might have to obey a conductor. Um, in other words, we should recognize that we have a thick, vibrant integument of culture and of, and of art lovers, and we should, to Janelle's point, we should figure out how to coordinate, because one of the frustrations is that an engineering class might have 300 students. My classes are capped at 15 or 20, depending on what the classes. I'm not asking to teach 300 students. I'm just pointing out that the capacity to contact students with the story of culture and cultures and art, you know, is limited. So we should, we should think about how we can use their, you know, essentially unlimited appetite for culture as a rapid way to engage with what it means to be human, you know, and help them do that more robustly. Um, so I'm Emily Richmond Pollock. I'm faculty in music, and yes, okay. Caroline, absolutely. <laughs> music is made by people. That's how I teach it, also with lots of critical thinking. Um, I actually have a, a different comment, though, which is something that came up, I think, when I was listening to Alice speak. I love the attitude that you have about thinking about who's in power, thinking about the ruling class, but I also want to point to the fact that the faculty have power, right? And there's a hierarchy of power within the institute, and I think it is it kind of feels good to be like, oh, the ruling classes are oppressing us when we're the faculty, but actually faculty need to both understand their privilege as people who are in the, you know, part of the professorial faculty, and to try to see the limits of that power, try to ex expand their power if we can. Those kinds of things I think are really important because if we see ourselves, if we sort of flatten things out and just assume solidarity with a lot of people that we outrank, we're missing a lot of the the opportunity, I think, to lead and to listen. Thank you, Emily. I, I, I fully, I, I thumbs up. And, <laughs> and, 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 and I also, in response to the question about leadership, which was asked earlier, I think that's a very important question also at this time. And I wanted to um, riff on asking questions we walk, which um, is, a, is a phrase that I learned from, um, from Alice, uh, I, I learned about it watching videos of her previous talks when Cheryl brought Alice to my attention as, as someone who 
we might well invite for, for, for today's keynote. Um, and I think that that's what we need to do right now. Um, in, in many contexts, the context in which Alice was speaking, but also in terms of the moment at MIT, um, uh, there are many questions that are ours to ask. And as, as we walk forward, we have to ask questions. So I'm, I'm going to give that as my answer to this person, the student who asked about um, uh, leadership in the present moment. Um, I think I'm going to let that be a wrap unless I see hands reaching for the sky. OK, you want one more? One more. students have to ask, and I'm wondering if there's been any conversation about themes, what questions you might all ask in your separate classes so that students hear those same questions over and over from different, from different classes and get a chance to discuss them in different ways. So we've brought up the theme of power, um, we've brought up responsibility, um, what does it mean to be human? I'm wondering if there's any been any conversation about What's something that could run across all your classes that students might be able to think about? Okay, I'm not going to ask all four, but does someone want to take that? Well, <laughs> I, I can say one thing, which is, so I teach in this, our graduate level program in PhD, our PhD program in engineering education. And two questions that I started in our history and philosophy of engineering education course and progressed throughout is, what counts as engineering and who decides? Those questions come over and over. And just thinking, helping students think that those are questions to ask and then to have regular conversations about answering. Um, that, that's something core for both us training PhDs in engineering education, but those folks go off and teach engineers. And then they bring those questions to their teaching there too. I'm sorry, go ahead. I would say that the theme that should go across everything is the interconnectedness of most things. And the ability, as I said before, to see the relationship between the particular and the general, or the micro and the macro, and not to allow that kind of, uh, what was the word you used about neoliberalism? The fractioning of everything and the focus on the narrow and not seeing the reverberations to others. That, that's what I would emphasize. So Microethics versus Mic macroethics. Yeah. And a very simple, this is both in Terrascope and in my sort of standard EAPS classes is, you know, having learned this, what is your response and your responsibility? Yeah, yeah. yeah and I, I guess finally values, you know, how do you think about what, what are values and how do you add value in the things that you do? Thank you all very much. Um, I'd ask everyone to please be um, seated for another minute. Cheryl is going to... Um, uh, uh, tell everyone what comes next in the day in this festival of learning. But before I let Cheryl do that, I want to do a few thank yous, including to Cheryl herself. Um, however, uh, Cheryl has a, a, a small army behind her, and I want to particularly call out uh, Gillian and Kate, who've been running microphones and doing much more. Kate Weishar. Um, Kate Weissar from the Office of the Vice Chancellor, who's been um, our key partner there. Uh, and, and, and Cheryl's principal lieutenant. Is that a fair description of Molly Ruggles? I don't know where or Molly my, is. You call her my boss. <laughs> oh, but that's you. Um, uh, so, so, so I want to thank all the people who've made the day possible. Um, and, and then I want to close by thanking the panel, including Alice. Thank you for mm. coming, and thank you all for coming. And, and okay. Cheryl, what's next? Great. I am the last thing standing between you and lunch. Uh, we have an exciting expo of um, groups um, downstairs in Lobby 13 and in Lobby 10, exhibitors um, who work at MIT at the intersection of climate change, ethics, and equity. I invite you to go talk with them and enjoy your lunch. And we have three awesome afternoon workshops that are listed in your program and online. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you to the AV technicians as well and to MVP again, Larry, for the video. Thank you. Thank you.